Welcome everyone to this meeting of the Australian Sensitive Data Interest Group. Um, so this is an interest group that meets approximately monthly to talk about um, all things sensitive data. Uh, this group is co-facilitated by ARDC, the Australian Data Archive, PHRN and the Melbourne Data Analytics Platform. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting today. Uh, for me, that's the Wajuk Noongar people here in Perth and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So uh, just a note, as you would have heard, this meeting will be recorded. Um, uh, and we do like to share these meetings on a um, ARDC YouTube channel. If this just means that if your camera's on or your mic's on, uh, you may become part of that recording. If you want to avoid that, then just switch those things off. Um, and if you have questions you'd like to ask at the end, but you don't want to be recorded, then you can just put them into the chat and I can uh, present them to our speaker. And in fact, uh, as we go through the presentation, if you could uh, enter questions in the chat or save them for the end, that would be great. Okay, uh, so a few things to do today. We have a few new uh, co-chairs for this interest group coming into 2023. So Felicity Flack from PHRN and Alex Mihalovic from uh, MDAP, who I didn't put there, but brilliant. Uh, so thank you very much to both of you for joining and um, opening up our uh, network of interesting uh, presenters who we can bring along to these sessions. I'd like to remind you that we have a mailing list for this interest group. Uh, you can sign up. I'll in a second. I'll pop a link into the chat with the uh, how to sign up to that. Um, but so we use that mailing list to let you know about meetings that are coming up. But you can also use that mailing list. So if you have something, some news you'd like to share that's sensitive data related or a question for the community, um, you're actually able to post back to that mailing list. So uh, any of you who haven't used that feature before, uh, you're very welcome to. The other thing is that we have a collaborative notes document. Um, we can take notes into that document today um, as we listen to the presentation. It's especially useful with often people will share useful resources in the chat, we'll pop them into there. Uh, but I've also added at the top a section for suggestions for future meeting topics. So if anything occurs to you, either that you'd like to hear about, or you hear about something really interesting, and you're like, yes, they should be presenting at OSDIG, um, then you can put that there. So I will pop a link to that into the chat as well in just a moment. Um, so uh, that's all of my nonsense out of the way. I'm really happy to introduce today's presenters. Um, I think that, so governance within one jurisdiction <laughs> it can be tricky enough. Uh, this project has been doing the very um, important and challenging work of trying to sort out governance across many different jurisdictions. And I think that for that reason alone, it's a really, it's going to be a really interesting talk. Um, but I also um, love to hear about sensitive data from ecology. I always find it really interesting. So um, without any further ado, I'd love to introduce Cam and Tanya to talk about the Restricted Access Species Data Project. So uh, I'd like to start by um, uh, acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the land in which we're speaking from, which is the Ngunnawal people, and acknowledge their elders past, present and uh, emerging. Um, as a bit of context for this project, um, uh, and I'll be talking about what con comprises uh, sensitive species data um, and the background of the project before Tanya then talks about uh, uh, some of the some of the um, solutions we're in the process of developing, but I suppose the way of kicking off um, uh, sensitive data has been a long term issue uh, in uh, biodiversity data. Uh, in fact, it probably uh, appeared just about the same time as everybody uh, actually was starting to compile uh, species data sets. Um, now, can I just pause and can everybody now see the slides? Yep, we can see it now. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Um, I might go on to the next slide. Please. Uh, so, uh, 
Yeah, as I was saying, um, sensitive species data and biodiversity data have, have kind of been issues since the, the first emergence of biodiversity data sets. So it's, 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 it's not only a national problem, it's an international problem. And it's, it's probably uh, on an ongoing basis, one of the single biggest uh, impediments to being able to undertake uh, landscape level analysis of uh, biodiversity data. Um, so uh, this, uh, this project was proposed as, a, as an ARDC funded project uh, with in-kind contributions from uh, 16 partners, partners including um, uh, all the government jurisdictions in Australia, as well as the Western Australian Biodiversity Science Institute, uh, the Atlas of Living Australia and EcoCommons. Um, the, the project uh, has kind of evolved a bit over the, the life of the project. Originally, it was, it was aimed at developing a, a national framework, a data repository, and then a demonstrator of a secure data haven. But over time, uh, that's evolved into, while we've, we've continued, persevered with the framework, the data repository is, has merged more, more with the concept of a sensitive species data service, which we'll be talking about a bit later. Uh, and um, while the demonstrator and, the, and a, the demonstrator of a secure haven for uh, data analysis has also uh, really uh, uh, um, continued to evolve over time. Um, our conversation will pr pretty much be, be focused on the framework and the data service. Um, in our space, there's a key dependency uh, insofar as the um, Department of Climate Change, uh, uh, Energy, Environment and Water is uh, currently developing a thing called the Biodiversity Data Repository, uh, which will be a, um, a, a shared view of the biodiversity data held by all ju jurisdictions in Australia, uh, that, that's used for decision making with regards to environmental uh, assessments. Um, that that project has, is interdependent with our project because really sorting out uh, issues around sensitive species data services is, is a is a important element of being able to build a sensible uh, biodiversity data repository, and it's also key to to our workplace being the Atlas of Living Australia, which is the largest uh, public uh, display of biodiversity data in Australia. Next slide, please. Um, so just kind of reprise what uh, restricted access species data is, and, and just to kind of kick off by sort of talking about terminology, um, Conventionally, in the biodiversity data space, people talk about sensitive species data. That becomes very problematic, and it was discussed at length at an early stage in the project because the use of sensitive tends to get very rapidly conflated with uh, official government um, uh, security classifi classification statuses. So one of the, the elements of the framework has been to try to disentangle what co constitutes true uh, I suppose, classified data from data that is sensitive or restricted for a range of uh, departmental or operational reasons. But uh, we, uh, we also, the, the project was also originally focused on uh, species related data categories, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Um, and it was very clear at an early stage in the project that while uh, the, the, the core was, was uh, sens sensitive species data per se. There were a range of, of behaviours around types of data that meant what was actually impeding data access uh, was a, a, a larger group of issues. And they include uh, personal identifiable information, uh, Indigenous data, uh, usage restricted categories, so things like third party data licenses, uh, data embargoes and the like. And then lastly, what would more traditionally be called sensitive species data. So, so basically data uh, that either from a conservation uh, or similar 
basis, you you wish to impede access to uh, information about the species, either the, the identification of the species or where the species occur or some attributes associated with those records. Um, so what is the difference between it? Um, most people tend to conflate the, co the concept of, of threatened species and sensitive species. And what's the difference? Um, so a threatened species are those species listed by legislation or recognised by programs such as the IUCN Red List. Most species, even if not seen, are widely distributed enough, populous enough, or simply so hard to find that regardless of whether or not they are actually listed threatened species, uh, they're more at risk from major uh, threatening processes, climate change, land cumi, uh, clearing other human perturbations, pest species. Um, and this includes rare species who might be have a wide distribution range, but a very inconsistent uh, occurrence within that distribution range, or whose presence in the landscape are basically that difficult to predict or that difficult to find. There's no actual risk knowing where those species occur. Sensitive species, however, are rare or even common species who, whose appearance, value, habits or rarity make their location information high risk if shared in the public sector. So the classic example would be uh, parrots that are, are, are valuable to wildlife trade. Uh, that, that can also include things like frogs, um, species that, that whose uh, occurrences um, uh, can be affected by threatening processes such as the spread of fungus, uh, in the case of one of the frog pictures there, uh, or simply uh, just uh, species that have a particular stage in their life cycle that makes them uh, highly sensitive if their locations are known. Um, most jurisdictions and some third party data holders like BirdLife Australia maintain sensitive lists, uh, species lists. Um, and so the, the purpose of the framework was to really deal with these sensitive species, species or, or, or as we're now intending to call them, restricted access uh, uh, species, um, but, but also come up with a framework for managing the, these things by also managing the other data uh, issues that I, I talked about in the, the previous slides. Next slide, please. So just to clarify that some threatened species are listed as uh, us Listed threatened species are sensitive species, some are not, and some sensitive species aren't listed as threatened. So there's overlap, but they're not necessarily the same. Good point. No. That's all right. Um, so uh, a key part of the project has been the uh, development of the uh, restricted access species data framework, uh, which is intended to be a non-legally binding document uh, it will out, outline consistent best practice guidance for sharing uh, restricted access species data between trusted parties um, and try to provide a nationally consistent method for modifying restricted access data for public release. Um, and just to kind of flesh out that a bit, what, one of the, the recurrent issues that we have uh, with regards to this type of data is that a very common um, uh, means of, of withholding the data is to uh, obfuscate the data by uh, randomising it or, uh, or generalising it, uh, the, the um, latitude and longitude. Um, because of the increasing prevalence of aggregated data sets in the biodiversity space, one of the commonest issues is you can get potentially get the same record from four different sources into an aggregated data set and legitimately end up with four different points because it's been obfuscated in four different ways. And the metadata has not been adequate for one reason or another uh, to actually track that change. So trying to develop a nationally consistent approach uh, is partly about where the data is made public, making sure that the data being made public is consistent enough that people can recognise uh, commonly obfuscated points. Um, the framework is, con is comprised, comprised of principles and guidance on uh, managing and sharing different types of RASD. So uh, uh, basically principles about how the data should be shared or, or obfuscated or, or modified, uh, provide consistency on, on how the data should be transformed. Um, 
it proposes a common approach to how uh, requ uh, requests for uh, restricted access data are, are handled uh, and also uh, suggests clauses for legal agreements. And, and another big focus of the framework is, is suggesting that uh, negotiated legal agreements are generally preferable to uh, standard clause uh, data license agreements in terms of adding uh, more legal protection um, for uh, um, both the data provider and the, um, uh, the data requester. Um, so where's the framework up to? Uh, we're up to draft 15. Um, in fact, we're hoping to actually uh, uh, have a final version ready by the end of this week. Um, the next project working group meeting is tomorrow. Um, the, the framework's undergone a fair audit um, and it's also been uh, broadened to include uh, the care principles about uh, Indigenous uh, data um, sovereignty. Um, the drafts have been reviewed by all jurisdictions and have also been put out to third party comment um, twice now. Um, the uh, uh, DECWA, the, the Commonwealth Department, has been briefed monthly, as have the, the state and territory jurisdictions. As I've already mentioned, we have undertaken broader public consultation. And we, we, while we started with a signatory type document, we moved towards a statement of principles, which most parties were more were happier with. Um, so basically, we would anticipate uh, publicly releasing the framework uh, towards the end of this month, uh, all other things being equal. And I'm now going to hand over to Tanya to talk a bit about the data service. So the data service uh, is um, currently um, in development where um, it will be a simple request management system that basically funnels data requests to data custodians. Um, not everybody who um, adopts the principles in the framework necessarily have to um, use the data service. It's voluntary and it's opt-in. What it does is track requests for restricted access species data so that both the requester and the data custodians know where the requests are up to at any point in time. Um, it includes a, an approval process and a release, just tracking the release of data. It doesn't um, transfer or aggregate or hold data. Um, so it's a simple request management system. We have, we are going to enable a DLI to be minted for each data set that's released to a data requester so that um, the data custodians can track those DIs and use them for reporting purposes to track usage and um, different elements of the data. Um, data sharing. Um, and then it also will include functionality for if a, a requester um, puts in an inappropriate request or breaches data, um, the legal agreement conditions and um, other custodians can be alerted, alerted to that and take that into consideration once they, um, when they get extra requests from those, um, the same data requesters. Um, and uh, I'd probably also add that the, the reason for taking this approach um, Early in the process, as I mentioned, uh, we were looking at a, a uh, uh, an aggregated data set or, or, or using the BDR as, as the aggregated data source to deal with some of these issues. It became very clear as we evolved the framework and the concept of uh, a, a, a aggregated data set that that, that that was problematic for a lot of uh, data custodians. And we did an international review of, of how these things work elsewhere, the answer to which is pretty much as ineffectively as we do it in Australia. Um, however, uh, uh, the Finnish um, biodiversity uh, information facility actually developed, uh, as far as we can tell, the only functioning uh, data service uh, in the world, uh, which uh, it, it was a very simple approach 
a la what Tanya has just uh, uh, um, outlined, where uh, the participants in the data service uh, all retain data sovereignty, sovereignty and retain the, the ability to transform and release data uh, themselves. Uh, but uh, what is effectively being developed is a front end that makes it easier for uh, data requesters to be able to go out to uh, most data custodians within uh, a national context. And that was certainly the, the feedback that we've had from third parties was that the, the data service was a, a much needed mechanism to make it easier for uh, organisations and individuals to identify uh, where data sets uh, exist nationally. And for some of these species, we're talking about 14 or 15 primary data sets. So it can be very difficult to disentangle and identify where those data sets sit in Australia. Sorry, okay. Tim. So part of the service will also include um, a metadata catalogue. Um, so a catalogue in one place that is a list of all the data sets that include restricted access species data that's searchable um, so that um, a data requester can identify which data set potentially might include information that they're or data that they're interested in for one purpose or another. Um, and then they can register and um, put in a request. And then that request is then, if it covers multiple data sets from multiple custodians, it'll field those requests, that request to each of the individual data custodians. And it will also track the negotiation and development of the data license. Um, sorry, the legal agreements between the data requester and the data custodian. Um, so as Cam said, we've, we did a review of um, international precedents. The only similar model for restricted access species data or sensitive species data was the Finnish biodiversity information facilities one. Um, we reviewed similar projects in the health and biology space and also um, had some detailed conversations with data place and that's being developed by um, the Office of the National Data Commissioner. Um, there is overlap, but it didn't quite meet our needs and nor the timeframes of our project. Um, so as uh, we went through a procurement process um, through what used to be called Digital Marketplace, the company was called MyIT or something now, um, we received six applications um, to develop the service and we've now onboarded um, our preferred vendor and development is underway. Um, they've been on board for three weeks. Um, it's a pretty ambitious timeline. Uh, we are scheduled to deliver the data service um, by the end of April this year. Yeah, you can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so another as, 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 uh, aspect of the project that's evolved over time, um, uh, we've spoken a bit in the presentation about sensitive species uh, lists or restricted access species lists. Because each jurisdiction in Australia maintains a list, uh, um, it's going to be relatively important nationally for users to have a to be to, to, to be able to discover what species are actually on with uh, which lists and uh, uh, what the level of, of fuscation is that's being applied to those species. So over the life of the project, we've also been trying to develop a single national list of restricted access species that uh, data custodian that third party data custodians can apply to their data again for this idea of national consistency in the way things are, are dealt with. Um, that's, that's arisen a number of issues. There are fair issues because not all lists are publicly available. There are vocabulary issues. Um, in particular, uh, the taxonomy of species names varies between jurisdictions quite markedly. Um, and there are methodological issues because the processes for identifying species and obfuscation isn't really consistent. I um, can't remember if there's another slide. So um, 
really uh, that that's involved a lot of meetings. Um, so uh, what we've been trying to do is reduce the level of con conflict in existing lists. So particularly where species are listed in more than one jurisdiction, trying to land some commonality of, of how species should be with, dealt with, which is frankly still ongoing. Um, but probably the, mo the biggest take home message that we've, we've had is to really try to engineer both the framework and the, um, the amalgamated species list or the national restricted access species list uh, in a way that avoids interfering with uh, existing regulations and procedures. Um, effectively, the approach we've taken with the uh, RASL has been to enable jurisdictions to continue to use their existing processes and species lists, uh, try to define taxonomy nationally for third party users, uh, make the combined list publicly available and get agreement uh, that jurisdictions will have an agreed process for new species. So basically trying to avoid any sort of conflict with effectively what are eight quite different processes. Um, And so that's it. When we'd like to thank our colleagues in the, the, the project and technical working group uh, that are involved with the project, because this has involved a lot of input from, uh, from uh, many people around Australia, and at least a few of them are on the call today. Um, and uh, also uh, ARDC and ALA, as well as the Department of Education for uh, funding the project. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Lou. Um, so we do have a couple of questions in the chat already, and I'd encourage uh, the audience to add some more there. But there were quite a few people who were interested in your processes around DOIs. So the first question, uh, sorry, is the DOI on the data before the request or on a specific request for the data? Um, so I think that they're asking, so is does all the data receive a DOI and that DOI is then shared? you know, or used when a request is made, or do I get applied once a request is made? So DOIs will come, uh, will be assigned to divisional data sets and, and often they already have um, identifiers assigned to them already. So we'll just reuse those. Um, what will happen when someone puts in a request, a, a DOI will be minted for that request and then it will include information around the parameters included in the request. So it might be for a particular species in a particular location. It may cover several data sets. It will give you it will report on which data sets were um, the request was used uh, that were that the request was derived from. And and who and when it'll it'll include some technical information as well. Okay, thank you. So I think that answers uh, the next question, which is how would the data sets integrate with existing data repositories, like those at academic institutions that already meet DOIs or have options for curated access? Yeah. Um, but uh, then our final question, Kristen, did that um, do you still have anything you'd like to follow up on that point after that answer? Yeah, thanks. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Cam. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's a, a interesting approach. I'm just trying to understand a little bit about uh, why you do it that way. So you said that um, if a data set already has a DOI, then that would just be associated uh, with the request and use. But you said in some cases there might be a new DOI minted that is the released data set. Um, now, uh, I assume that there's not a, that's not a duplication thing, but that maybe is the data set being released, it's a subset of a larger data set or it's an amalgamation yeah. of multiple data sets? And that's the, uh, both of those things. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right, that's, that's helpful. Um, so then a related question is how are you, um, uh, it's not my area, but I've got a colleague who's very much into data provenance and tracking, you know, if, if a data set in DOI is assigned, you know, around the collection point and then is kind of 
amalgamated with other data sets or subsets are used exactly as you described, how do you track that, you know, your DOI here that's being used for this particular project relates back to, you know, the, the mm -hmm. original DOI? The DOI will, that's attached to the data set, the requested data set, will include um, the source data set in the, in the DOI metadata and it will include that DOI. So that's all the source data, data set DOIs will be included in that. Okay. All right, thanks. So to enable someone who comes later, that they can actually recreate that request if need be, because we can't attach the data necessarily to the DOI because it's all restricted access and sensitive. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So do those DOIs, they resolve to a record within your service in your catalog? Yeah, we'll be using data sites. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so another question, um, RASD is obvious, obviously species based so how does it handle endangered communities or is this a good question um so uh uh no noting the uh i suppose the uh the temporal and and funding limitations of the project we we had to basically uh um, identify what was in and in and out of scope of the project so uh the the two areas that that were identified for things that would would have to be a next step but but not dealt with in the project were uh it became very clear and i'm going to drift off sideways and then come back to actually answer the question it became very clear uh during the project that that uh there was quite a, a substantial proportion of uh restricted access species data that was effectively restricted for cultural reasons um so what we've done is kind of put uh, uh, I suppose holding statements in the framework for dealing with those issues and then recognise that what actually needs to happen is a separate process that actually looks at the cultural issues around uh, this type of restricted data. The other, the other big issue that was quite quickly identified was non-observational data, aka ecosystems, uh, communities um, and uh the we basically identified it as out of scope simply because it was too complicated to deal within the confines of the project uh we we needed to basically sort out what was happening on a species species record by species record basis before any consideration could be given to ecological communities noting that some of the issues with ecological communities actually overlap uh, complex survey data where you, you've effectively got the same basic issue where which is if a sensitive species or a restricted access species forms part of the community uh, the vegetation community identification or indeed is one of the, the species observed at a, at a uh, uh, information rich plot site in both cases you're going to have problems uh, withholding the record because it affects the functionality of the data. But that, that will be uh, the next problem to solve once we've finished this project, unfortunately. So, and the other difference is that um, the framework predominantly deals with point data, whereas um, e um, endangered eco ecological communities are usually polygon data. Um, and as far as I know, at least from the uh, Commonwealth um, Commonwealth perspective, um, I managed the section that did that data and they release it publicly anyway, um, because there's less risk. Um, some of the factors including um, targeting specific species are less, the so risk, Risks associated with that are, are, are much lower than not releasing that data publicly. For example, land clearing can wipe out a whole community if no one knows it's there, for example. So for a risk-based approach, releasing data publicly, at least from, I can only speak from the Commonwealth's perspective, um, Phil might want to talk from the state perspective, but as far as I, I'm aware, most jurisdictions release that community data publicly. 
Um, yeah, um, I think you're asking me. In New South Wales, we don't have an issue with releasing that sort of data, but yeah. I think I raised this before that there is the possibility you can treat polygons using the same yeah. sort of algorithms that we do for points so that you end up with sort of a a, a grid representation of a, of a polygon, which would be obfuscated in a similar way. Yeah. It's not it's not impossible. Okay, I have, uh, will the list of all restricted access species be available external to the ALA in machine readable form? Each of the jurisdictions have uh, have different maturity levels with respect to how they they store and share um, species data. So um, we're not interfering with any of those processes. Um, restricted access species data won't, essentially the service is host, it's going to be hosted at least initially by the ALA, but it's not, it's separate to the ALA in terms of what we don't necessarily own. And it's a, um, it was a collaboration between all the jurisdictions and really that we, like we said, we're not transferring data. We're relying on the existing processes that, um, or storing data, we're relying on the existing processes that each of the jurisdictions have in place to do that. This is merely a request tracking service. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose with re particular respect to the, the amalgamated list, potentially, but I, I don't think we're mature enough in our conversations with, with all the project working group partners to really confidently say that it would be available externally, but that's the intention is to move in that direction. Um, will the license agreements and legal clauses be in the release information that's due to come out in the next few months so that others can see these documents without a data request? Or is it specific to a data request? So there's, in the framework, will include, does include um, suggested legal clauses. Um, the specific license agreements for each request will be um, treated as sensitive information and not released. Um, publicly. So yeah, there is suggested clauses and again, each jurisdictions have their own legal departments and they might be slightly tweaked. <laughs> we've only put suggestions in there and we've had feedback from uh, some NGO data providers such as BirdLife Australia that because they don't, they're only a small operation and they don't have a big legal um, department or none at all, they're really happy to have something like that to use to um, create their own licensing agreements. I think Chris, Kristen's got his hand up. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, a related question. Um, and you did mention it in your talk about the data service. I just, I just missed the detail. So you said the data service is a, is a simple uh, request management system, but you did say something about uh, whether it be kind of storing the the uh, completed agreements or not, can you can you remind me what that was? I just didn't hear it. Very well. Yeah, at the moment it will be tracking the negotiation stages of that agreement, and then it will also say it's finalised and it will store a document ID only. Um, at the moment, we're not going to be storing the actual physically physical agreements because we're using uh, an external a different service to do the signature process for the agreement um, and that'll be stored in that and there'll be links to that and the data custodian and requester can download um, that those documents the final final documents so if i can ask a supplementary question to that does that mean then that um, uh, your group is kind of one of the parties involved in the uh, execution of the agreement or named in the agreement or has a kind of assigned responsibility for manage like overseeing those documents or are you just kind of you're getting a tracking number that kind of allows people using your service to you know, yeah. keep everything recorded yeah, in the the, spot? The latter. yeah okay thank you i'm only going to do a slightly manual process and they'll send me the agreement and i'll send it to the signing service and off it goes 
I'm not, yeah, I'm not helping drafting or anything like that, or even tracking. Um, and, well, and you're not not responsible for for management of the document. You just kind of offer a, a technology service there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I, when I ask about the data sets themselves, what will the data sets be? E.g., just a current data or monitoring data, etc. And what is the process for identifying them? Apologies if I missed those details. Um, it'll probably it'll it's a mix of it'll be a mix of survey, systematic survey, and incidental observation data, and museum collection data. Essentially, um, it, it's basically uh, the, the, it it it's really the data sets that the uh, that that each of the data custodians sign up to the service have available. So it would be the same as a, approaching. New South Wales or WA environment departments and asking them access uh, to Bionet or, or, or any of the other uh, state data sets or approaching the museums and herbaria via the ABH or OSCAM. Um, they're, they're just the, the, the similar sorts of amalgamated data sets that, that, that exist in the ALA. Um, it's just that because you're going directly to uh, the, the data custodians, some of the limitations uh, that do exist in ALA data, such as as complex data being simplified uh, to meet Darwin core principles, may not necessarily be an issue. Thanks. And uh, one last question at the moment. If I'm managing a specimen collection, how easy will it be for me to confirm if there are restricted access conditions in relation to a particular species that I'm working with or considering learning out? So there's a two part answer to that question. Um, you can actually do that currently, albeit with uh, with a, a slight error margin attached. Uh, you can actually uh, uh, load a, a species list into the ALA. The ALA has all of the um, the current sensitive species lists in Australia loaded into it. Um, I do have some re reservations about saying that because there is a, a, a slight error margin associated with it. Um, if the if the process that we're currently embarked on is completed, then the idea would be that there would be a publicly amalgamated version of the list with uh, uh, the obfuscations required in each state and territory. Um, and we've also been in conversations with a few of the third party data set providers, uh, such as BirdLife Australia, who do have their own sensitivity lists about how they might be able to contribute to the process as well. Thanks. Uh, so I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat at the moment, but to be honest, I'm really curious about just what the process was for managing uh, coming to cross-jurisdictional agreement at this scale across Australia and whether there were any particular challenges that you had in trying to create that level of alignment. Um, look, I, I, I think it was a very collegiate process. Um, uh, I, I think it was made slightly easier in our space because it's universally recognised that there's an issue. Um, I think the, the 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 key to agreement, though, when when we started the project, most project working group partners were uh, keen to have something akin to a, a signed document, either a, a non-binding legal agreement or a legal agreement it became abundantly clear as the pro process went on that that was just not in any way, shape or form ever going to be achieved. There's just too many variances in, in uh, approaches and, and uh, process to make that achievable within a short timeline. And I, and I think the, the single biggest learning that, that we would have would be that uh, recognising from the start that the best approach was the, the sort of principle-based approach where organisations can voluntarily indicate uh, compliance with rather than uh, trying to get signatories to a, a document would have, I think, probably cut the time required by about two thirds. Um, and, I, I, and frankly, 
I don't think a binding legal agreement, had we continued down that track, would have been achievable, ever. Nor do we have a governance body to be have oversight of that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and actually, that's a really good point, Tanya, because, of course, the other thing is, particularly uh, under the terms of our funding, we, we need to develop uh, uh, um, uh, sustainable management of the, the framework and process that would not have been achievable with a legal agreement because uh, we would have had to establish uh, uh, a recognised entity that could actually manage this to the satisfaction of all jurisdictions in Australia, which was similarly almost impossible now that uh, you'd, if you went back 20 years ago, the, the Environmental Resources Information Network within the Commonwealth often coordinated those kinds of activities. But, but these days, that kind of national coordination is very difficult to establish or get approval for. So, so again, going down the principles-based approach has proved to be uh, the key to success, I think. Thank you. I think that's a really valuable observation. Um, so uh, one last call out to the audience and to my co-chairs if anyone has any last burning questions. Okay, I think that that might be everything then. Um, well, yeah, I'd just like to thank you both so much for sharing uh, your experiences. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the framework. Um, so yeah, you said uh, fairly shortly that'll be coming out. Um, how can um, people in the audience who are interested, how can they uh, keep track of what's going on and be informed when that comes out? Um, we can probably just flick a copy that can be circulated once uh, we've finally got everybody to uh, pull out their teeth and uh, reticently confirm that they're all relatively happy or at least not unhappy with it. <laughs> well, um, then maybe uh, I can, when that's available, if, if you let um, let me know, I can share it on our um, interest group mailing list. I think that might be a good way. And I'm sure we'll also be promoting it um, through our AID, ARDC channels as well. Um, brilliant. Yeah, well, I hope to have a... Um... A website or you know, a web page up in the coming weeks which will include some FAQs and um, sort of a bit more about the project as well um, yeah which will hopefully have updates on um, when the data service is up and running <laughs> and links to that well when maybe when that goes live we can um, link from today's meeting notes there so that uh, anyone who's interested from today can find that as well. Um, and I'll be making this recording available as soon as I can and also linking it to my collaborative document. So um, but I know that there were a few people who said they couldn't be here today but were really excited to hear about it. Um, brilliant. Well then thank you both Tom and Tanya and thank you everyone for attending today and all your questions. It's been a great meeting.